Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. So, what a difference a day makes. Good morning, I'm Steve Clemens. I'm Washington Editor-at-Large of The Atlantic. It's a pleasure to be here with an outstanding panel that has grown dramatically in the last 24 hours because just about this time yesterday, a decision came down on the Supreme Court uh, that has resulted in the title uh, of the session today, uh, the Supreme's latest hit, The Affordable Care Act Survives Another Test. That title is all due to Britta Stevenson here at the uh, Aspen Institute, so thank you, Britta. But we have um, a lot of issues. I was talking to Tom Daschle a moment ago about really which direction we should take this, and he said it really ought to be the What's Next panel. We have so many things. So we had a decision, which we're going to discuss in a moment, but it answers as many, it, a it raises as many questions about what are now the next layers of questions of uh, undone responsibilities in the healthcare arena, things that aren't part of this, kinks in the system, uh, and let me tell you who we have here to discuss this. We're going to have a conversation, and we're going to leave plenty of time, although we've chewed up a bit of it, uh, with all the excitement of all of this, uh, to, to involve as many of you as we can in the discussion as well. But just to my right, of course, we have the uh, just over PTSD, uh, uh, <laughs> former Secretary of Health and Human Services, uh, former Governor of Kansas, Kathleen Sebelius. Um, we have a couple of Senate Majority Leaders here, Bill Frist, of course, Senator Bill Frist, who is also a surgeon, heart surgeon, saved people in the Capitol. I'll never forget the day uh, in which he actually went to work uh, and showed the world what he could do beyond legislating, so it was quite uh, uh, fancy. And Nancy Ann DeParle, of course, who is both Deputy Chief of Staff in the White House, uh, but was the Director of Health Policy for two years during the period when the Affordable Care Act was passed. It was really one of the, uh, with Kathleen and others here, one of the primary uh, architects. And of course, Senator Tom Daschle, uh, another Senator Majority Leader, uh, part of the Obama franchises we, we, he was a health czar, we could call that at one point in this, and, and uh, uh, has written extensively about health reform uh, in all dimensions, made this one of his own uh, legacy uh, elements in his congressional career, as did Henry Waxman. Henry, who is, uh, has just stepped out of Congress, has just retired from Congress, um, chaired uh, the House Energy Committee as well as the House uh, Government Oversight Committee, and, and has authored so much legislation uh, that passed over, over decades in, in the health policy debate, that he too is part of the thing. So I've told Bill Frist uh, that if there was one person who stood out that was not the other, he may be it. So he's going to have to work a little bit harder uh, here today. But I, I wanted to start perhaps with Kathleen to give us just a quick snapshot, headline zingers, of what the decision yesterday did do and what it left undone. Well, the decision in the King v. Burwell case was really about four words that are in the statute um, and whether or not they should be the prevailing words in the statute. And those four words are established by the state. Uh, King, the plaintiff, suggested that um, those four words should be interpreted to mean that only individuals who were in an exchange established by the state should be entitled to tax subsidies. No one else uh, should be entitled. So there are 34 states that actually use the federal marketplace as their method of enrolling and engaging in the Affordable Care Act. 17 states have their own state marketplaces. So what was at stake, really, was 34 states, 6.4 million people in those 34 states who have subsidized insurance policies and if the court had indeed ruled for the plaintiffs, uh, they would be subject to losing the subsidies which made their insurance affordable, consequently losing their insurance. But well beyond that, as if that wasn't dramatic enough, uh, that people who have had insurance coverage for a couple of years could lose it and then um, they and their families would become once again uninsured, uh, the entire individual insurance market in those states, the rules for the Affordable Care Act, have one large risk pool. So even if you weren't in the marketplace, if you were an individual in Alabama or in Kansas or in Texas who purchased your own health insurance in the individual market, those customers dropping out of the market suddenly would mean that rates would skyrocket. You suddenly would have a very unbalanced risk pool, and it's exactly what the individual market used to look like, where rates went up each year. Younger and healthier people dropped out of the market. Older and sicker people stayed in the market, and the individual market was on a slow death spiral. This would be a very rapid death spiral in those 34 states. So it had a lot of economic consequences, 
certainly a lot of individual consequences, a lot of consequences for hospitals and doctors who now counted on that payment system, and a lot of consequences for insurance companies who for two years have been in that competitive market and suddenly would be looking at a very dangerous and precarious financial situation. So there was a lot at stake. John Roberts, Chief Justice, ruled, uh, wrote for the majority in the 6-3 decision. And he basically said, you need to look at what Congress intended. Congress intended to help fix the insurance markets, not destroy the insurance markets. You have to read the case in its entirety. And I would say it's the strongest possible decision. They could have said, we're only deferring, we're using the Chevron deferral. We're letting the ruling of the IRS, the administrative ruling stand, which would mean that in subsequent administrations, a new IRS could say, well, we see this very differently. We, so this is definitive. We, this is definitive. They said this is what the law says right. and it is constitutional. Let me quote, you know, I, have, I sort of collect beautiful uh, prose that's snarky yet that praises something. And, and uh, Bill Frist has something that would go in my, my Hall of Fame uh, that he apparently wrote last night. So I'm going to read real Bill, Bill Frist's line here. It says, the Affordable Care Act with today's decision settles firmly and securely into institutional and cultural permanence. Obamacare graduates now from political toy to the policy stature of Medicare and Medicaid. The decision signals that Obamacare grows up and now becomes the Affordable Care Act. It is woefully imperfect because of the miserable way it was initially written and passed, but after five years, the new certainty for insurance markets will permit dot, dot, dot. So Bill, I'd, I'd love to get, I, I, I just, Really, you should write for us. Henry uh, Waxman. Uh, you know, I, I, I think it's, Waxman it's terrific. Can hear but, but you. He helped give us a it. snapshot of, of what you saw as the stakes of yesterday's yeah. decision. No, we, yeah. and, and how were you surprised at the robustness of the decision? I think Kathleen summarized it very well. And the one liner from Justice Roberts will be the one that uh, we come back to in terms of insurance markets intent, and that we really are all in this to bolster insurance markets, and, and I think he captured it. Mm -hmm. Captured it better than the legislation and the law actually did um, uh, initially. I look at it pretty simply. We have the, the reality of what the implications of yesterday are. Then we have the, the uh, politics, you know, what are the implications for the future of the elections from a political standpoint, the world that many of us have come from. And then the, the substantive policy uh, end of it. And those are sort of the three buckets a simple surgeon thinks in. The reality is it changes nothing. The six million people aren't gonna lose their insurance. No law has been changed. The law is out there. It passed yesterday. We'll forget it by later today. The I reality, think about it. that's right. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, so that, which is a good thing, because as Kathleen says, and as I mentioned in my piece, or, or it may have been in that part, it brings a, an element of certainty that political figures who are uh, answering not just to principle and sort of do the right thing, but also to the, what the people are thinking and feeling who don't like Obamacare for the most part. It gets more certainty. And then on the, the substance, it opens up, there are things we need to fix that, uh, that we can come back to right. as we talk that, that I think is really important. So the reality is, is, is no change. The political end of it is big because it says, the courts and the, are no longer going to be right. the battlefield. It's going to be in the political arena. And on the substance, we have some great things to be done, but it's going to require all of us working together, and that's going to require a new president of the United States in the next election. So before I leave you, just about everybody you used to work with is running for president. Yes. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. so, so what, would, what would be your counsel, outside yeah. counsel to them? Because this now affects the the political terrain, particularly if you're a GOP contender. Yeah, yeah. And it really comes back, uh, the Kaiser Family Foundation, I'm on the board of that, just disclaimer, but 42% of people as of today don't like it, 39% do. And if you're trying to fix something, if there's uncertainty out there, you can hide behind this sort of vague, well, a lot of people don't like it. The fact we have more certainty today because the courts are out of it now. There'll be some little court decisions, but it's no longer in the courts. It's in the polit politics and the substance of it. Now, the, our elected leaders, coming back to the presidency, is gonna have to come out and say, we're gonna work together to fix this. Mm -hmm. It was passed in a partisan way, blame Republicans as much as Democrats. Well, whenever you pass a, an unpopular piece of legislation mm -hmm. in a partisan way, 
whenever there's difficulty, people run from it and say, those guys did it, we didn't. There have been two elections, there are going to be a third, and most of the people elected, the new people were elected not liking Obamacare. Why? Because most people don't like Obamacare. That sort of cloud out there means it's going to stay a political issue out there. It's intimate, it's going to affect, health care is going to affect everybody in you. Your health care costs are going to go up, so it's going to stay a political issue. The answer, I think, is the president, it needs to, whoever it's going to be, is going to have to come after the election and basically say, we're going to bring people together. The Republican, in all likelihood, is going to you know, be still out there opposing, maybe repealing and changing. It's going to be incumbent upon them to be very specific of how they're going to replace it, or the American people aren't going to buy it. And the Democratic leaders are going to have to say there's some difficult things in there. Because remember, most people don't like it. Democrats may love it, but most people don't like it. They're going to have to come out and say there's some bad things in there we need to fix, and we need to come together to fix it. I think a lot of it is going to come down to the state level uh, in terms of where the focus, the political action is going to be. Now that some of the uncertainty, the judicial element has been removed, I think that is going to empower a lot of people who were against exchanges, mm -hmm. against Medicaid expansion, all of a sudden with the uncertainty, the permanence established that it has reached the stature of Medicare, Medicaid, will have some confidence in coming to the table and actually fixing so things. Before I jump to Nancy, let me ask Tom and Bill to say, what do you think Mitch McConnell's next move are? And I'm going to ask Henry, what do you think John Boehner's next move is? You want to jump in? Well, I think, I think Mitch is probably still going to be under pressure from a lot of his far right, the presidential candidates in particular, to schedule at least one more repeal vote. Uh, they're going to want to make yet another statement, not because they think it's good politically uh, in November of 2016, but it's good politically for their base. They want to keep their base energized, and they use this legislation as the way to do that. In the longer term, I don't, I don't think that's going to work. And if I were McConnell, I would work on those things that actually might bring Democrats and Republicans together. We saw it already with the sustainable growth rate, brought a huge vote together. We saw it with the extension of the community health centers. We saw it uh, in the House with... Uh, uh, with 21st century cure. So there, there are all elements. Recent things, all yeah. recent things. All recent things. optimistic. And I think what the American people really want to see is Congress working together. And they're not going to work together right now on the ACA, but there are a lot of parts. There's a lot of bipartisan agreement on payment reform and the need to move away from fee-for-service. Right. There's a lot of agreement on transparency, the need for greater transparency than what we have today. I think there's a lot of interest in, uh, in changing the way we deliver care. And, and you both generally agree on that, right, you and Bill? And no, so we no. don't agree. No. <laughs> <laughs> just, just wanted to no. kick the tires. Yeah. No, I, I think, the, and I'll be quiet, but there's a lot of optimism, what Tom just said, the, the SGR, which you tried to fix as leader, I, did. I tried to fix as leader, we couldn't do it, and we had people working together. And now you have this hot partisan bimodal Congress, and they came out and fixed two months ago in a bipartisan way, huge health care bill, which is a little element of optimism in Congress. And you mentioned faster cures and, and others as well. Yeah, with a stop to payment reform as well. I mean, yeah. in that bill. Yeah. I mean, it's, so I, it, my point, I guess, is that once you get beyond this, this emotional debate about ACA or yeah. Obamacare, it's amazing how many things out there might have the potential for some reasonable dialogue and some consensus. Henry? Your question to me was what John Boehner would do. <laughs> uh, well, we voted over 50 times in the House of Representatives to repeal the law. Mm. So I guess they could vote another time to repeal the law. And Nancy and Ann and I were talking about whether the Senate ever had such a vote. Maybe uh, McConnell will put that to a vote and everybody can then say, I voted to repeal the law, I have no responsibility for it. Then we all move on. Now, the Republicans dodged a bullet yesterday because they, in those red states, they would have had to figure out what to do with the middle class who now had health insurance. The opinion polls show that most Americans did not want the court to, throw, to go the other way. In the past, Obamacare is an abstraction. Many seniors came up to me and said, I don't want uh, Obamacare. I don't want government health care. I want my Medicare. Leave it alone. <laughs> it was all an abstraction. But yesterday's decision, had it gone the other way, would no longer have been an abstraction. People, through no fault of their own, who finally had insurance, 
would no longer have that insurance. So the Republicans uh, can express their opposition, and we can move on to areas where we could get bipartisan support. And I am encouraged that the that Congress is now moving in a more bipartisan way in the health arena. And I do not think it's because I left. <laughs> I, I just got a just quick just got a quick lesson from Nancy Ann and Kathleen uh, over breakfast about what the costs of. Of, of repeal would be. And, and on June 19th, a report came out from the new shiny Republican-supported uh, director of the Congressional Budget Office who brought that very uncomfortable uh, notion that even with dynamic scoring, the cost of repeal would be about $137 billion. Without dynamic scoring, $353 billion. Nancy Ann, how does that impact the debate? Because that's not been over. That's not an overexposed data point. So no. that, that, that must last raise the stakes, the burden of those people who are advocates of repeal because it changes the game. I mean, because at the same time, you've got, you know, the Grover Norquist crowd out there not saying you want to you want to pay, you know, find new ways to pay for things or raise taxes to pay for things. But, w but wouldn't that result in that if there was a successful repeal? Well, it has a huge impact. And CBO both said, uh, up to $400 billion, um, and that doesn't even take account of some of the reforms that they assume would continue right. that have made changes to the way that health care is delivered and are reducing costs. So even with that, it's $400 billion. It would knock 19 million people off of coverage. Um, it hugely changes the debate, I think, and, and the question about what does Senator McConnell do, because he's had a team of people working on uh, how to repeal the law using reconciliation so that he would only have to have 50 votes uh, in, in the Senate to do that. Uh, it's, you have to, to, do, to use reconciliation, you have to be able to show a budget impact that you reduce the deficit. This is not gonna reduce the deficit. So I think it does, um, I think, lend credence to what Tom suggested, which is that if, if I were Mitch McConnell, and I think Tom's suggesting this too, I would just take a simple repeal vote and move on and get onto things that you can work on that are more, um, progressive and positive. But I think it also says to, to, you know, one of the most irritating criticisms of the law to me um, is that it didn't have any impact on costs. And uh, I see people like Sister Carol Keen sitting in the audience who is working with um, hundreds of Catholic hospitals across the country, and I think she can tell us that it had an impact on costs. They had to uh, rein in their costs considerably. Uh, you know, the CBO's uh, analysis certainly underscores that. This law is beginning to bring down costs, beginning to do uh, some of the right things in improving quality. So, so repealing to, it would be the wrong step. Go ahead. Just Jackie. to follow up yeah. on that, I think Nancy Ann's absolutely right. Uh, the mantra is this is busting budgets, uh, costs are out of control. We have had the lowest <laughs> health inflation in 50 years, as, ever. The lowest sustained health inflation, and that's not just individual insurance prices going up at a slower pace. It's overall health care costs. It's private employer costs. It's um, we are finally in the ballpark of starting to trend relatively near GDP with health inflation. It used to be double GDP. It has come down, and it has the first couple of years people said, oh, it's all about the recession. It won't last. Uh, it's now been five years, and it continues to trend in a very positive Captain, direction. How, Drug prices are alarming. How much, um, every other country has seen the flattening of cost and, and spending, and there's huge debate how much is structural, how much of it is recession, and I've kind of come out that half of it's recession and half of it's structural, because there's huge structural reform going on. How much of the, first of all, the cost savings, if you repeal Obamacare, because with all the tax increases, they go with the, the, the repeal, so of course it's going to cost a fortune. And I'm not a repeal person. I don't think a lot of substantive thinking recognizes just repeal for the reasons that Henry said. Unless you have an alternative that's compared to the Affordable Care Act as we know it today, not in the pre-ACA world, but today, the, the ACA world has become the standard. It's institutionalized. It's culturally there. It's not popular. So the repeal vote, you say, how could these crazy Republicans 
take this to another vote to repeal it when it's so impractical. Remember, the American people do not like this bill. There are more people who regard it unfavorably than favorably, and if you're a politician who wants to get elected and be a great leader, the, the, it's is, not is there crazy. An, is, there an, is, there, is there a Cruz care out there or something? Yeah, where's the alternative? That, yeah. no, that's, where's the I alternative? Think that, I think that's, point. That's, Henry, that's Henry's point, yeah. that, unless you put an alternative on the table. Right. And that's, well, they that's have an the alternative. Thing. They've always said just run a large risk pool. Just go back to the old days. Yeah, put everybody who's sick. That's the Republican uh, alternative, okay, okay. and it's been suggested say, over I, and over I again. I think what, what people uh, are doing, is they're listening to their political leadership. If you're a Democrat, you're going to listen to your Democratic leadership. If you're a Republican, you're going to listen from, to everybody from Mitch McConnell on down saying how bad it is, and you're going to say, well, they say it's bad. But then you <laughs> ask them, well, what do you think about right. the fact that you can't ever be dropped again? Oh, I love that. What about the fact that your children can sign up to your parents' plan? Oh, I love that. That's in there, too? What about expanding Medicaid to people that otherwise could never have any access to insurance? I love that. So we're talking about the Affordable Care Act, you know. Well, I don't care what it's called. I love those things. I just don't like the Affordable yeah. Care Act. Well, and if you call it Obamacare, yeah, it goes down even that's more, right? right? But I think I'm that's sure. it. I think it's, what don't you like? I don't I like think the it's Obama really, part of Obama. It's, it's right. not real right. for a lot of these people <laughs> until you can tell them Henry. what the bill does. <laughs> Somewhere along the line, despite the propaganda words that people use in talking about this issue, there ought to be an examination of the facts. <laughs> oh, Henry. One of the objectives. Oh, Henry. One of the objectives of the law was to reduce the number of uninsured. That's happened dramatically. The second objective was to reform the health care system uh, by all the incentives to change from pay for quantity to pay for quality, uh, to hold down costs by making health care more efficient. Uh, we were told more by the Republican leaders in the House, so I won't blame these Senator Fresh, but we were told more people will lose their health insurance if Obamacare is continued, not true. More people will lose their jobs, not true. It will, budget, it will break the budget, uh, that wasn't true. So at some point, people have to evaluate what has happened with this law. And I think by any measure, it has been a great success. Now, the Republicans can say, Obamacare, we hate it. But as Tom Daschle said, you go through all the parts of it, and now it's a reality for millions of people. I think they're going to start thinking that perhaps uh, when they hear the mantra, this is a terrible thing that's happened, people are going to just say, well, yeah, I don't like Obamacare, but things are happening in the right direction. Uh, so uh, uh, at somewhere right. before elections, you would hope that people would look at what the reality is, not just the propaganda. I think it just, is. just on the cost issue, because I don't know if we're going to come back to it, I think we have to be very careful in two things. First of all, uh, we have had this flattening in spending, and the policymakers and everybody here at Aspen, we can talk about that. And I think it's, it is important. Other countries have seen it. And again, there's lots of Republicans, you know, say don't pay attention to it, and, and others will say Obamacare has caused it all to flatten, saving you so much money. The truth is somewhere in, in between, but I think we have to be very careful because from a policy standpoint, we have seen a flattening of spending. It will increase over time. Probably most half of it's structural, of which Obamacare is part of it, mm -hmm. but the private sector and capitalism and markets and competition and innovation and creativity, which are outside of Obamacare part as well. But if you do, do look you at the last- there's enough <laughs> competition and, and innovation, or, think, or could there be more? I, there a is? lot more. With the transparency, you know, Obamacare yeah. and the Affordable Care Act worked in that regard. We need a whole lot more. Mm -hmm. Yesterday's decision where you are, when a, when a patient walks into a surgical care clinic or sees a doctor, and they're bringing money with them, which is what Obamacare does through a subsidy and insurance, you have more transparency possible in pricing. You don't have as much cost shifting going on where you have to you know, tax the insured people and, and charge them a lot more than the uninsured. And that's a good thing, there's transparency, but we need a lot, lot more of that. But on the cost issue, just let me close on real quick. If you look at the last four quarters, because we can't be complacent about that, the individual has seen almost a doubling of the percent increase compared to last year each quarter. And Drew Altman in the Wall Street Journal has a great chart there, so just watch out what we're saying about that because costs are exploding. With deductibles so high, more skin in the game, our out-of-pocket expenditures are skyrocketing. The cost issue is something we have to address, and in fixing Obamacare, 
of whatever fixing it means, and in the new legislation, cost is going to be the issue out there, and that's what the individual is going to feel. As their costs go up personally, they don't care that we say as policymakers there's a flattening in spending because they're paying more for what they were getting five years ago and ten years ago, and that's a problem. Let me ask Nancy Ann and Kathleen for a minute um, something, and, and I want you to pretend that we do not have a thousand people in the room and that this is a small confessional just of us. Um, <laughs> And, and share with us, now that the Supreme Court decision has made this definitive, that we've gone from toy to the Affordable Care Act, a la Bill Frist, that this is around, can you tell us what you got wrong? What, didn't, what wasn't in uh, the Affordable Care Act that should have been? What are the reflective things that now that we've had a little bit, you know, five years of history, do you wish had been part of this package that weren't been? I want then ask everyone in, in just a few short form minutes, because I want to go to the audience, what are the, the two or three things that are the what next things that we need to fix now? What should be that agenda? Nancy, Nancy Ann? Well, from my perspective, um, I've thought about this a lot, and the one thing I would change would be to have had some Republican support for it. Mm. And, you know, we did everything we could. I spent hundreds of hours personally. Uh, the president spent a lot of time meeting with Republicans. Um, Senator Chairman Baucus and his team, uh, you know, the, the law was famously delayed in the summer of 2009. Uh, couldn't be marked up in part because he was spending so much time trying to get Republican support. And while that was uh, extremely uh, annoying and frustrating at the time we were going through it, you know, not a day has gone by since the law passed that I haven't wished we'd had Republican support. That would have made all the difference. We might have still had, um, you know, attorneys general in various states uh, bringing lawsuits, but it would not have been nearly as uh, ugly as it's been, and we would have been able to address some of the problems that needed to be addressed as, as what time went on. What are some of those? What well, would be your list of two or three things that need to be tackled? Then? I don't know that I have a list of two or three things, but there are... There are areas where, well, this language, the established by the state, if someone really thought that was a problem, I mean, I'll tell you a story. So after, I, after we passed the law, about a week after the president signed it, I called together our big team at the White House and HHS and labor, and I said, everyone bring your list of technicals. So we had a big stack of things that they would fix. I don't even know, I don't think this was in there because no one thought it was an issue, the established by the state. Um, and one of the guys from our legislative affairs office came in uh, to the meeting, and we were walking through each issue, and he goes, what are you doing? And I said, well, we're getting ready for the technicals bill, because there'll be a technicals bill, there, right? I'm looking at oh, you, there always is, is after a big <laughs> bill passes. And he looked at me and goes, you don't get it, do you? This is, they're not going to allow us to make these kind of changes. I kept the list, because I kept thinking, eventually we'll all sit down and we'll, go through and work mm -hmm. on these things together. After the Medicare Modernization Act passed with the prescription drug benefit that many Democrats opposed, um, there still was you know, a technicals bill, there still was an effort to work together and I expected that. And that's, mm -hmm. I think, the thing that we mainly, we, we failed at. I, if there was something we could have done, I, I wish I'd Kathleen. done it. Well, I don't disagree with Nancy Ann that that was a fundamental issue. I do think at some point uh, the president had to make a call, go or no go, uh, because everything under the sun had been tried, and um, it was clear there wasn't going to be uh, support. And then the Scott Brown election made it even harder. So there was only one way to get the bill through, which was to go back, have the House take the Senate bill, which was, uh, as Henry can um, attest um, no easy feat because the Senate bill, the Senate version of the ACA and the House version of the ACA were very different. And um, probably the most and remarkable. Ours was better. Yeah. <laughs> it was um, in many ways. Uh, the most remarkable room I ever sat in was a room where the president actually was negotiator in chief with the Democratic leaders from the House and the Democratic leaders from the Senate for about eight or nine days in a kind of conference committee reconciling these bills. Uh, so we knew what a great bill would look like, and then the Scott Brown election happened, and that was no longer a possibility. Um, I think there are lots of issues, uh, administrative issues, uh, you know, the debate about um, how much paperwork an employer should file, how you get to 
documentation, how big the market should be, whether you extend, I think it's a very legitimate discussion, whether you take the small market definition up to 100 people. I mean, those kinds of things need to be put on the table. Whether the Cadillac tax has the right target point. Uh, it was put out in 2018. And do we have an environment those fixes can happen? Well, that's the problem. Yeah. I'm not until 2017. I, 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 think, I think the problem, and it's important for people to understand, you hear this political messiness that happened, and I said it was miserably passed and messily written in my little blog. You left that out, I think. Great snark. But, 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 yeah. but it's the point that they're making. I mean, obviously, I have to put a little ump into it. But the point is to make the way it passed, the bill's got good substance in it. I mean, it's, it's good fundamentally bones. got that's good a, bones, a, good yeah, skeleton. Good Bill Friss tweets, by the way, and that's a tweetable moment. Yeah. <laughs> Bill Friss says hey, Obamacare no, has good no, substance the in the it. Substance has, the, the, the substance of it. But, right now, tweet it. Stop, let me talk. <laughs> is they, they, the problem is, um, and when we write this stuff, it has to be regulated, you have to fix it not just in the technical fixes immediately, right. but it's an iterative process. Yeah. And that's yeah. why our gut yeah. system of government is set up with a House and a Senate, Republicans and Democrats, you come together, you write a bill, you have these opportunities to fix it. The opportunity to fix anything or modify it was removed totally mm -hmm. because of the way it was passed, yeah. because there was no Republican at the table at all. You could always buy somebody from the other side. I shouldn't say that. Okay. He was leader, I was leader. But and for Medicare, I know. Oh, wait a minute. We, yeah. we wanted them at the tell table, me, and they were at the table. Tell me somebody like Olympia Snow, who probably loves, who I love. But when Olympia she's in Olympia Snow is viable. She, I don't know. We shouldn't get she this deep. She was in the room for three yeah. months. But, okay. Senator, but no, she the was point, in the, the point room, is, and so, her ideas are in this Medicare was, not, <laughs> Medi <laughs> Medicare was not passed this way. Medicaid yeah. was not. Social Security was not. Welfare reform was not. Obamacare was. The problem is, forget that. The problem is, in the five years since then, if it's passed in a partisan way, it gets increasingly partisan when the American people don't like it because you're electing more and more people who basically say, it's not my bill. And the point is, a good bill, good substance, but you always have bad things in it. We haven't been able to fix the bad things over the last five years because you can't work together because it wasn't, it wasn't put together in that spirit. I know you tried, and it didn't work, but if it had worked, these fixes would have come along. It'd be a much easier process. We'd be so further we're running along through the time here. But Tom and Henry, one minute each. What would be the two or three things on your what next agenda? Steve, Tom? let me just say, I, I think we're, we know we have three big problems. We have an access problem that we addressed. Mm -hmm. We have a cost problem that we've talked about. We have a real quality problem. This is legislation that is designed to address all three, although the insurance side, the access, has gotten the bulk of the attention in the first Just five years. a couple years. of other legs out. Now we're going yeah, to move yeah. on yeah. to payment reform, to deal with cost, moving yeah. off of fee-for-service, coming up with innovative new ways to address cost and, and, and control it and a lot more effectively. Of what people are and then to yeah. delivery reform, right. to address quality. We still have a mess out there in measuring quality. We've got to figure out, if we're going to really talk about value, We've got to find ways to be able to measure quality to assess value. And that's something that you're going to see a lot more of as we go forward. We're going to have new tools to do that. There are two driving forces, policy and technology. Right. Policy and technology married together will help us address all of those challenges in the coming years. Henry? All of the things that Tom Daschle just outlined as to what we need to do, the administration can do without Congress because demonstration projects were written into the bill, uh, different models could be tried, and uh, so we're going to see things develop without Congress passing any uh, new laws. Uh, and I think people are going to be cognizant of the fact that while some people would have said, if we're going to redo the health insurance in this country, why not take the model that most other countries have, which is a single payer, the Medicare model? The reason we didn't is because the president tried to get Republicans and Democrats to work together, so that they, he chose the Republican model that was put forward against the Clinton health care bill, which was private insurance companies competing with each other in a marketplace where the consumer can make a choice. So he made this as modest and bipartisan as he could, the Republicans chose, notwithstanding enormous efforts, not to be part of it. Uh, what can we change legislatively? I think we have to 
do what we can to get the states to pick up the Medicaid option. It's ridiculous that they haven't. It's free money that helps their health care providers, millions of people who are uninsured. It would help the economy of those states. And notwithstanding that, governors and legislators are saying, oh, we don't want that because they're indifferent to the consequences of it. We need to get the Medicaid part fixed. Uh, pharma got too good a deal in this bill, mm -hmm. and we need to go back and correct some of those problems. But even after we correct those problems, the big cost driver that we're now facing is the rising cost of prescription drugs. We have to come to terms with that. Right. And I think we have a law in place that is a success, and we need to work around it. But I think the, the, the posturing politically will go on. But we can now work for bipartisan efforts in the future where Congress will have a role, especially in the next couple of years where we have a Democratic president, and even after that, the next four <laughs> years after that, when we have a Democratic president. Fight, fight <laughs> so uh, Bill Frist has a quick tweet. Yeah, just a quick thing. Quick so tweet. The challenges ahead, which is really where we should be thinking, and I'm glad we started with this because now we have four days to really talk about the issues. The going, using Tom's construct, the access issues, Obamacare did a good job there, but we still have 10 million people are covered. Now, we still have 20 million people without insurance. We have cost shifting until we have affordable access for them. Right. 40% of, 40, 40, 40 of the people who could be subsidized today are enrolled. 60% or about 50% can still be enrolled. So people like the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, many right. private foundations, public foundations are together. We've got to get them enrolled in order to make the insurance markets work. Right. And so the access issue on the Medicaid side, hopefully removing this fog of uncertainty in the court system will allow our governors and court system, uh, governors and state legislatures to come before and go ahead and expand the Medicaid up to 138, 140%. And on the cost side, the payment reforms, which Obamacare in, in part got going, but the private sector is really working with, ultimately will come down and look at the cost issue as well as the value issue, measuring quality as we come forward. Those are the challenges out there, which together, government and the private sector, if we work together in a bipartisan way, we can so, solve. Somebody send that transcript down to Bobby Jindal. But you're beginning yeah. to hear, uh, just, yeah. just a cautionary note on cost. And, um, Henry's absolutely right. The act has administrative authority that's never been there. Huge, shifting the government trillion dollar government payment system into quality and they can do it without congressional permission. What Congress is beginning to do under the current leadership is start to flag areas where they're going to stop cost controls protecting Medicare Advantage plans. There are three or four bills in now protecting uh, some drug pricing, which is being, so that's one of the things we're gonna need to watch is when Congress says, no, you cannot accelerate cost measures based on quality, we're gonna protect our constituents. Do we have a mics out in the audience? There we are, the, the lady with the white hat. I like that hat. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. So we're, we're like in the last five minutes. Um, this was a robust panel. So short questions. We won't have lightning round answers. Yes. The actual cost to to avoid care is actually pretty low. This year it was three hundred dollars something. Apparently it's going up to six hundred dollars something. So that that people can avoid having to enroll and pay the kinds of fees that it will take to actually enroll in insurance. Right. What was the thinking, those of you who were involved in it? about this question of avoidance, a penalty to avoid being insured, sure, question. and, and how, how can we overcome that? So let that? me give that to Nancy Ann, if you don't mind. Yeah, well, um, we looked at that a number of different ways. In fact, the original um, one, two year ramp up was designed by Olympia Snow, who you mentioned, Senator. Um, so this was a bipartisan effort to figure out what would be the sweet spot, what's the amount that uh, will get people to enroll but not be punitive. And in the first year or so, especially, they wanted it to be relatively small. Uh, it, it isn't just $600, by the way. It's, it's a percentage of your income. So if you're a higher income person and you choose not to enroll in insurance, it will be a higher penalty. And the only real model we had, remember, was uh, Romney Care, Governor Romney's reforms in Massachusetts. And those penalties were smaller than the ones in the law. And the thinking among all the economists who looked at this was that Number one, Americans obey the law. So if there is in the law a requirement that you either get insurance or pay this penalty, they will come in. And that 
what they've seen in Massachusetts is that eventually they come in. Will it be There's still a 5% uh, to build, 5 of the population who we'll have, have not. Are, are there many, many people, Bill, in the GOP that, that really recognize it was folks like John Chafee, Mitt Romney, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who were the real leaders on the mandate? Because there seems to be a lot of... of, of, of Revisionist history. Yeah, revi yeah. yeah. <laughs> because I mean, Hillary Clinton hired John Chafee's person who helped write the man, the, one of the first mandate pieces you know, before she did. So the Republicans own this ground. Oh, what round? Man, individual yeah. mandate? Oh, the heritage. I don't, I don't think the individual mandates. Mandate. Yeah. Yeah. This individual yeah. mandate came about during the, the I think the question is, after. is this enough? Basically, I, most people think you need to get everybody to have some kind of insurance. We have failed. We've still got 20 million people out there who have, don't, aren't covered. Is this individual mandate high enough to force people in. Is well, it, Kath, do you? And the important thing is, are the insurance markets robust enough? That's the issue. Yeah. Do we have a mic over here for this gentleman? Uh, yeah. We've got somebody there racing comes. towards there. you. Here we go. In terms of what's next, um, we, we know that a lot of what's driving uh, the conversation around improving value, decreasing cost, costs, and improving quality are these upstream social determinants of health. I'm curious at the federal and the state level, what is necessary in terms of opportunities to address those social determinants from the private payer side and the federal government side? How do we start to look at ways to have healthcare systems do a better job by addressing upstream factors? Tom? Or well, I think that's a, such a, an important question, and I think we've got to look beyond our health sector to do this. Uh, we've got to look at nutrition, and there is a good deal of effort now underway to link nutrition and health in a much more constructive way, especially for younger generations. And That's the really. Care Act had and, menu labeling. I don't a know little bit louder, Nancy. The Affordable Care Act had the requirement that chain restaurants label menus with calorie counts right. and. But it's, not, it's, but it's also prevention. access yeah, to these, to these uh, opportunities. Too many people still don't have access to good nutrition and, uh, and, and opportunities to learn about nutrition and health. And I think we have to do a better job in the schools in order to create that new environment. I know the Surgeon General is here. So yeah. wave to everybody. You're dressed in a uniform. I feel so guilty. You dress <laughs> like that in Aspen. That's Vivek Murthy. He's really cool. And we're going to be talking about this in the closing session uh, of, of Spotlight Health. Kathleen? Beyond, I, I think there are lots of social determinants, but the two that underbride most chronic conditions are smoking and obesity. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's any question that in this administration, there's been a doubling down on both of those. We've talked about some of the nutrition. Certainly, Michelle Obama has changed the conversation, not only in this country, but around the world. People are beginning to think differently. But smoking, thanks to the Congress, FDA finally has nicotine control that can go after uh, the offsites, they're dealing with the deeming rule, which would take in all tobacco products, and driving our smoking rates down can have a huge impact. Henry? I, I just want to make one observation. When, after World War II, we had health insurance, people got it through their jobs. The group that didn't have health insurance were the people who didn't have their jobs when they retired, the seniors. That was the fastest growing area of poverty. So we passed Medicare. When we passed Medicare, there was a provision in it that said, this law is not uh, intended to change the way medicine is practiced. This was something put in to satisfy the AMA. Now look at where we are. The Affordable Care Act was intended to change the practice of medicine in this country. And we're using Medicare, because what Medicare does is copied by other private insurers. We're trying to give the incentive for the whole healthcare system to figure out new ways to provide care efficiently for people with chronic conditions. They shouldn't have to go from one provider to another. There ought to be some cohesive ways for them to get the care they need. So we are putting in place uh, 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 an effort for the government to give the right incentives. It's going to come from the private sector within certain bounds. They can't sell a shoddy insurance policy anymore. <clears throat> They've got to have certain minimum uh, standards, but ACOs or group payments or uh, hospital-based innovations, all these things are happening right now. And we're, we're living in a very exciting time. Bill, and prevention is very much a part of this. Thank you. Bill, I'm going to give you the last word of a session. 
And I'm going to ask you, if we hadn't had the Supreme Court decision, had our great program on big issues of the 114th Congress and health <laughs> uh, proceeded and not been hijacked by events, what would have been the takeaway zinger you would have left us with? <laughs> I think for, for this session today, um, kind of comes back to the last question. If you look at health, not health care, health system, government stuff. Now, if you look at the health of Nashville, the health of your communities, which is what you should be thinking when you leave here, what are you going to do? The social determinants of health, this last question over here, are 5% environment, 15% socioeconomic of health, 30% genetic, 40% behavior, smoking, seat belts, uh, and the like, and only 15% government Affordable Care Act, how good a doctor Bill Frist is, what kind of legislation it is. It's important, but if we want to have an impact on health, what we all need to do is leave this conference, go back, go to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation website, see what your county is in terms of its population health with 22 measures, the true health, the burden of disease, the burden of well-being, and say, where are we? And then challenge your local community leaders, not your doctors and not your politicians, to come together in the aggregate and say, we want to go from 15th in the state to first in the state. That is the way we're going to address it. It's not going to be through just politics or Affordable Care Act or better doctors or better hospitals. That's good, but that's only 15% of the gist. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please help me in thanking Henry Waxman, Tom Danschel, Nancy Ann DePaul, Bill Frist, and Kathleen Sebelius. Thank you so much for joining us for this morning session. Thank you, Steve.